speaking the truth. I'm Fahima Mohammed, your host for tonight, and we're here live on Ahlul Bayt TV. I would love to uh, also remind you that within this conversation, you are more than welcome to call in live and discuss with me the topic that we are about to put forward to you. Tonight, we're going to be again addressing another issue and challenge that reverts do come across and they do face. And this show is for everyone, people that are seeking to learn about the religion of Islam, people that want to come into it that are new or people that are already existing so that we have better understanding of each other's backgrounds. It is really important that we do participate, we do take sort of the interest and support the show because we are trying to bring communities together. Sincere Communities Services is a new platform built and designed for this particular purpose. And if you do want to find out more, please do check the website, which is www. And inshallah, we will now uh, continue with our show. And I have my guest for tonight. We have Catherine Al Joda. Salamu alaikum, Catherine. Alaikum salam. Thank you so much for joining me today. Um, before we start, I also want to just say that uh, we do have our Sheikh coming on board. He's just slightly delayed and inshallah he will join us you know, towards the show as we continue. Please do look out for that because we do need um, his sort of uh, insights as well. But today we have Catherine who is here as a revert. Um, she has turned to Islam in her later mature years. And Catherine, can you first start off telling us a little bit about yourself as we're going to go into the topic discussing new Muslims and their children? This is what we're going to be talking about today, which hopefully we can share some insights as to what are the challenges when reverts do convert into the religion of Islam and how does the rest of the family, namely their children, come on board? So Catherine, tell me a little bit about yourself first. Uh, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Um, well, let me think. Uh, I'm now 59 years old. Um, I don't look a day over 21. Okay, I accept <laughs> no, that. No, you don't. <laughs> uh, um, uh, yeah, I, I came to Islam at the age of 53. Uh, I was uh, brought up in the Catholic religion, and to be honest with you. Uh, there are a lot of similarities, I feel, to the Catholic religion as to Islam. Um, and I didn't find it that difficult. For example, um, uh, modesty and, um, uh, and, and the kind, uh, and the, well, I think modesty is one of the, one of the things, but uh, yeah, I just didn't find it that difficult. Um, so I was brought up as a Catholic. Uh, I left the Catholic faith. Uh, I made a conscious decision when I was about 19. And I had about eight years, which I now call uh, my years in the wilderness. And then I, um, I came back to, to God, to Allah. But uh, I came back still as a Christian because I didn't know what else I could mm -hmm. be. But uh, I, I never, even from the youngest of ages, I never believed uh, that Jesus was God. And I, I never understood the idea of the Trinity. Uh, and I was like this from a very, very young age. I had a direct relationship with God and I couldn't understand anything other. So I think I was probably always Muslim, but I didn't know <laughs> about Islam and people uh, people used to tell me I wasn't Christian, and mm. people used to suggest maybe I was Jew. <laughs> I was a Jew. Oh, no, I'm not a Jew. Um, and in the end, I think in my late forties, I got tired of being told you're not a, you're not a Christian, you know. Uh, and I thought, actually, you're right, I'm not. So I gave up Christianity as a religion, and I just kept God. Um, and then. Um, and I was very happy. I had no intention of, of taking up any religion. I was happy with God. Uh, he's my one true love. And, uh, and, and I was just at peace like that. And then I started speaking to people in Gaza. And uh, 
uh, uh, you know, and, um, you know, went behind their cause. And we talked a lot about God because there's not much else to, you know, to offer in terms of hope. And it was really interesting because the more I talked to them and the more we talked about God, the more I felt this is my God. You know, this is the God I've known all my life. And um, I felt closer to these Muslims um, than I ever felt to the Christians that that um, shared my faith in the past. And then I decided to read the Quran. And uh, once I read the Quran, it was, it just, I, I, I thought this is where I should be. <laughs> Why didn't someone tell me early, earlier? Um, and so I became a Muslim. But uh, I, I originally just wanted to be an, a Muslim. That was enough. And But the people in, in Gaza that I was speaking to said, no, 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 you must choose. You must choose. Uh, so uh, I read... And I've always looked for the most direct uh, route, the purest route to Allah. So I became Shia. MashaAllah, that's a beautiful, beautiful introduction. I mean, you've highlighted so much and I know you've got so much more. Um, the thing is, what really captures me is that, you know, um, when I've spoken and sat on these shows before, and a lot of scholars do say that the reason why it is actually mentioned to be a river is because we do all come, like you mentioned, from the faith of Islam. It's just that sometimes we're not labeled that to begin with because it's just mm -hmm. who we are brought up with. And there are so many Muslims even that you know come from Muslim families that don't actually have that enlightenment anyway. So we need to be really mindful about this and we should all be respectful to each other because we don't know when it's that pinnacle point where we are going to be in a particular way and we, there is, shouldn't be any judgment on anyone. And uh, SubhanAllah, that's in a very, very beautiful story. Tell me a little bit about your profession and what you do, because I think it's really fitting with um, even what we're going to speak about today, about the importance of family as well. Yeah, uh, well, I, 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 I've had lots of different careers. I had one in industry, and then I've always wanted to be a writer. So I did a degree in, in uh, script writing. Uh, and then I realized I had to have a day job. <laughs> so uh, I... I, I did a year of occupational therapy and decided, you know, that the academics was interesting, but the job, no, not for me. Uh, mm -hmm. So then I, 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 I turned my hand to, um, uh, to social work. It's a kind of interesting, actually, because I, I, I have this great love of, of God. And uh, I actually wanted to... I like talking about God. I like thinking about God, and I I wanted to 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 work as a minister. <laughs> Actually, I wanted to work uh, as a job with with God, <laughs> and uh, I I I saw this um, like a bishop or something, uh, and I said I I want to be a minister, and but I said but I said I, there's a problem. I said I don't believe Jesus is God. And I don't believe in the Trinity, you know, so there's a whole, well, the basics actually of, of Christianity, I don't believe. And he said, oh, well, okay. He said, I think you've got a, um, you, you've got a vocation. Uh, he said, run with it. He said, we'll soon find out. So I ran with it and very quickly thought, no, what the, the message I have to bring, uh, I don't think the people here are ready for. So I, I decided um, that actually my my calling was to work funny enough in in uh, in Jesus's footsteps and and that was strange because I had such a problem with with the prophet Jesus as to what I thought about him how I felt about him this whole notion as a Christian that he's God uh, so I don't know why you know, but the message came, you walking in Christ's footsteps, which is actually on the streets uh, with the poor, with the hungry, with the, the drug addicts, with the prostitutes, you know, it's like this. So I said, okay, I'll go with that. So I became a social worker and I've spent the last nearly 17 years uh, working mostly with children and families. Um, and uh, I've done lots of things, but predominantly I've worked with um, children in care, uh, which is what I'm doing at the moment. 
That's absolutely lovely and wonderful and really, really inspiring as to how you put yourself out there, especially in those most vulnerable situations. Um, when it comes to our new Muslims and their children, as you've highlighted that you entered into the religion of Islam at a much more mature age. So mm. I would presume that a lot of the times when Muslims do enter, um, they're not actually taking their entire family with them. And if they are, you know, just single, not yet married, it could be a different story and a stage in their life. Mm. Because once they do mm. enter into a, a marriage, then obviously then they create that family, which is the upbringing of your new sort of faith. But I assume now, which you are obviously going to clarify with me, that you have obviously got much older children and they're not from your own faith as currently as you are. How does that sit with you and how do you manage that? Well, um, I, I, I never had my children baptised. I didn't know why at the time. Uh, I, I tend to go a lot with, uh, you know, uh, if you like, internal messages. Uh, what I did was I taught my children about God. I taught mm -hmm. them through the Bible because that's all I knew about. Uh, we did go to church, um, but I did not have them baptized into any religion. Uh, it was more important they had a love and a relationship with God. And um, there's nine years between my children. So before my second daughter was born, my first daughter, at about the age of uh, seven or eight, um, asked if she could become baptized into the Christian faith. So that's fine, it's her choice. And I've always felt that it's my children's choice to make that, you know, to choose where they want to, where they fit. Um, so yeah, we had a baptism, it was very beautiful. Um, and a lot of our friends uh, took part and they all wished, uh, they all gave wishes for her spiritual growth and development and path um, and she's remained uh, a Christian. I have from this daughter five grandchildren. They are all baptised in, into the Christian faith. Um, and then I have uh, my younger daughter who is now 19 and uh, I became a Muslim when she was I think about 13. Right. Um, and uh, again she had she occasionally said, shall I be baptized because all my friends are baptized? And I said, you know, it's up to you. Uh, maybe you should read a little bit about it or we can talk about it. And she used to think about it and go, nah. <laughs> so so, so she, she was never baptized. Um, and uh, a bit like, like when I became... <laughs> yeah, she, when when uh, when I when I became a Muslim, she was actually really angry. And um, I'm glad to ask you that. Actually, what was the response of your children? Because you obviously yeah. are quite respectful of their choices. What was the response of them, knowing that now you're taking on this new faith? Yeah. Well, my youngest daughter was living with me, um, and she was really angry, and she wanted, and and it was about. The kind of things that teenagers get angry about is, um, oh, you, you know, we, you're gonna, you're different, you're gonna wear a hijab, you know, you're gonna look. We, at the time, we'd, we'd, we were living in a very, very middle class white neighbourhood. There were no Muslims. There was no one wore a, or a hijab, and uh, she was just mortified. You know, you're going to show me up. <laughs> so, so we had a. So, so I'm sensitive to that, you know. And uh, yeah, so we right. had a. We had a. We had a deal. And I said, look, I said, you know, I will. I will keep my faith to myself, you know. And uh, you know, I, 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 I will. When I go to London to the mosque, I will you know take my stuff and i'll get changed on the way and stuff like that and i won't wear hijab around this this town this little town uh, because she'd be mortified so that was the agreement and i prayed in my bedroom and and i kept you know i kept my faith it's it's always has been very private for me so you know it was yes. no big deal and um and i didn't want to push her away not from me or even from God, you know. 
so uh so that was good but then and then she used to come into the room when i was praying you know and she she would she would um make a bit of a fuss um and and i was very very clear with her that that nobody and i meant nobody gets between me and god so she must respect um my my views and my faith and you know she can stay out of my room if if the prayer mat and things upset her that's fine but please you know leave me alone and um yeah she got that message and i think it's important that that respect you know that that, that, that i you know my 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 faith is given due respect i won't have it any other way uh, and and i very rarely i'm quite an easygoing parent uh, so so when i when i do that with my kids you know they certainly sit up and listen um and and it's funny because uh, you know uh i brought my kids up in a very conservative way with a small c um you know in terms of how how we dress and um you know i kept them close to me um Thank you for so, sharing that. Look, I'm sorry, I'm going to cut you for a bit because I just want to quickly sure. introduce our chef. Salamu alaikum, yeah. chef Ayub Rashid. Thank you so much for joining me. Eventually, you are here. Wa alaikum wa salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, Sister Rashida. Thank you very much. And uh, salam to Sister Catherine. Alaykum More than salam. welcome. Um, I just want to quickly brief you in. Um, Sister Catherine has. Uh, turned into Islam at the age of 53 and she's now 59. She has mature children who are not from the same faith. So we're trying to see how do we live together because it's very easy for new Muslims to come into the faith at a younger age before marriage, for example, and create their own families. And, you know, they take on, you know, that new journey. But this is something slightly different, which I think a lot of us do not consider, even as Muslims, when we dis discuss and we talk to other uh, new Muslims, whether they've just recently come into the Islam or whether or not they have been there for years, they always have challenges. When I speak to reverts, when I speak to people that have come into Islam, they are sharing their stories, which is even new to me. And I'm really, really happy that we have this platform because we need to have more sort of like collaborations. We need to have more discussions and lots of conversations so that we can have better understanding. And especially when it comes to family dynamics, we always think as Muslims, we are Muslim, we bring up our children in a particular way. But I've even heard so many scholars say that even if you come from a scholar background does not mean that your children turn out in that particular way. We have great influencers out there. And unfortunately, even their own family members are not, you know, influenced in the right way. So we have to be mindful that Sister Catherine here was sharing with us that she has got elder children, mature children, minimum age 20. And they weren't happy for her to actually take on the faith of Islam. But she said, I'm going to respect you and you respect my faith and I will not bring my faith into your face and into your life. So she does live kind of a double life in order to protect her children, in order to still keep the family unit together. I want to ask mm. you, Chef Rashid, what is your opinion about living in a dynamics where the family <laughs> unit is not of the same faith background what is the guidance mm. on that and how do we move forward i think it's a very very important question and a very very important insight that catherine has shared with us tonight Indeed. Uh, could, could i just yes please yes yeah, i just uh that my youngest daughter actually did uh come to islam in the end mm. okay. alhamdulillah <clears throat> In the name of Allah, the beneficent, the merciful. Uh, first of all, I thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the one who gave the light, the guidance to Sister Catherine, and she saw it, she took the opportunity, she became a Muslim. You did the right choice. May Allah bless you, keep you safe, and on Sirat al Mustaqim, on the right path, inshallah. It is a difficult choice to make when you are 
a minority within the majority and they don't understand you they don't think the choice which you made is a right choice because of propaganda against muslims and especially towards women uh, to the level of prime minister who can make a funny joke i don't know whether it's a joke or he was serious about that against women so it's difficult however alhamdulillah allah made you to choose this decision and you took it and now one of your children is a muslim alhamdulillah what i can say here is that number one islam does not say when someone becomes a muslim he should abandon his non-muslim family that is an islamic to abandon your family we see in the holy quran where allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about our parents he says live with them in kindness but if they force you to believe or to choose a path which is against allah do not obey them but keep good company with them so it this is the wisdom of the holy quran and when we look at the history number two of islam how the holy prophet muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, started his mission in makkah as well as in medina muslims were the minorities and you could see that within their families there were people who are non muslims take example of ammar son of yasir and sumayya it was Amar because of his good akhlaq, good mannerism. He made the father and mother to become, to become Muslims. And there were many cases like these. So your example is the example of Ali Muslims. And how beautiful to say that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, the Holy Prophet said, Bada al-Islamu gariban wa sayaudu gariban kama bada. Islam started as a new strange religion to people and it will go and it will become again strange like the way it started so your case it is a case of early muslims and it is number three your akhlaq your morality the way you carry yourself within the religion which will attract many people to follow you because islam tells you to be good to your mom, to your dad, to your neighbors, to your children, to the whole community. This is Islam. I, I wish if people would understand this, then I think many people will become Muslim the way we see now in America, even here in UK and, and in many other parts of the world. So it is a hard decision, difficult to choose, but you have chosen it and it bear fruits because you want to practice Islam. You know what? The way the scholars say, there are two types of Muslims. There's a Muslim by choice and there's a Muslim by chance. You are a Muslim by choice and it is because of you many people will become Muslims, God willing. Thank you so much, Sheikh. I'm so happy that you're with us tonight and to have your wisdom and insights. It's an absolute honor. And what you highlighted is so important, um, and especially for people that, like you said, we inherit our religion. We don't, we still have to choose it, even if we're born into it. It's really, really important that we do that. And Catherine is an amazing example of the manners, the akhlaq, and the way in which she saw her religion and she did set the, set the boundaries, even if there was conflict at the beginning. Tell me, Catherine, um, how was the response if you had any Muslim sort of like um, friends around you, knowing that you were living in a, in a household and had sort of like, you know, children and family, especially children, because people always say, you know, when you're Muslim, then, you know, you have to mm -hmm. raise good Muslim children. How was the response or did you have any response for Muslims in that manner? No, not really, because um, my children, I mean, I only had my youngest daughter at home. And to be honest with you, she came to Islam not that long after me. Uh, and I think the Muslim mothers uh, wanted their children <laughs> to spend time with my daughter because, um, I mean, even now she uh, is not practicing. You know, I think, and that's a normal, I think that's a normal uh, step for a lot of young people. I went through it myself. Um, but the choices she makes 
about how she conducts herself and how she lives her life is still as a Muslim. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm incredibly proud of her. You know, with my other daughter who um, doesn't really practice Christianity, the children um, don't really, the, my grandchildren don't really, but uh, I, I, I pray when I'm there, I pray. And it's funny, my two eldest grandchildren, they're only seven and eight, um, and when they were younger as well, they used to come and watch. And, uh, you know, and I think you have to just uh, continue uh, it, in your beliefs and, um, you know, and talk to them about God, the same as I did with my own children, and, and um, let them see that... Uh, you know, I can tell you absolutely that the God of Christianity, I presume the God of Judaism, uh, you know, it's the same God. You know, there's not a lot of Christians think Allah is something, some other God, you know, but I can testify um, that, that God and Allah is the same God. It's the God that I adored as a young, young child and the same God that I adore now. You know, there is absolutely no difference. And that is why when I read the Quran, it made absolute sense. Uh, and, and, and what is important for me uh, with my own, per my own family is they, they, they reflect on, on the presence of God. Uh, you know, I can't do any more than be myself. Um, I'm saddened, really. Sometimes my grandchildren are not really brought up, um, not necessarily religiously, but spiritually. Uh, mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, I'm a long way from them and there's not much I can do. But I'm, I'm, I'm proud of the way they are living their lives because they're good people and, and this matters. I think you highlighted something really important there as well, which comes on to my next questions, especially to the Sheikh. A lot of Muslims, even today, uh, we have children that we, you know, help them with their practice of Islam, with the rituals. But listening to Catherine, it seems like what highlights to me that our religion, a lot of us forget, it's not just the actual rituals, it's the morals and the religious studies that come together. And I think a lot of even Muslims forget that, that they can go pray and they come out of their salah and they're not actually making the right choices and decisions. And we need to obviously combine the both. And that's what creates that real essence of our religion. What is your take on hearing Catherine Shay? Yeah, indeed, what she said and what you say too, uh, we see that in the understanding of uh, uh, many scholars within the religion of Islam, they say that, that any messenger who was sent by God to people came to do three things. Number one, to preach to people about God. And as Catherine said that the God is the same God. If you look, for example, at Surah Al-Ankabut in uh, verse number 46, the last part of the verse says, وَقُولُ آمَنَّ بِاللَّذِي أُنزِلَ إِلَيْنَا and say, we believe in that which has been revealed to us and revealed to you. Our God and your God is one, and to him do we surrender. And in many places in the Holy Quran, you can see these kind of uh, uh, meanings that the God is the same God. So now as for Muslims, when we mention about the way scholars say that messengers came to preach three things. Number one, about this true God. He is one, he's the same God, he's Allahu, he is a Somad, and so on and so forth. Number two, they came to teach us about moralities, mm. how to mingle with people, because the religion is how to deal with one another. Whether that one you deal with is a Muslim or non-Muslim, that is part of your faith. Akhlaq, the Holy Prophet says clearly, Indeed, I have been sent to complete, to perfect the good morals. All the messengers came to do that. I have come just to perfect them. Number three, messengers came to teach us that there will be a day which will be known as Qiyamah, 
the day of judgment when we all will be returned to Allah. So now if you take us as Muslims, if anyone forgets about the, the issue of moralities and how to deal with people, then it seems that he doesn't understand that Islam is a ritual, Islam is akhlaq, Islam, Islam is the way other scholars say, al-imanu wal-amal. It is faith and actions. You can't say I'm a believer, you go, you pray, and then when you come outside the masjid, you are not a Muslim. You will not be a good Muslim if you, you act like that. You are a Muslim in your house, you are a Muslim in your masjid, you are a Muslim outside there, you are a Muslim. You are a Muslim. The word Islam, you bring peace and you surrender to Allah. Wherever you, you go, you have to be a Muslim. So this is very important for us to practice our faith. Those who believe and they do good deeds. So it is, it's very important. And maybe to end this particular uh, point with, we remember the hadith of Imam Jafar al-Sadiq, the sixth Imam, who says, preach your faith to people, but not with your tongue. Mm. Do it with your actions. When people see you, they will follow you easily because they translate your actions as the religion not what you say Correct. that is beautiful that is absolutely Correct. beautiful and i couldn't have said it any better myself sheikh honestly mm -hmm. um listening to you has really really highlighted what we're here about today in the show and like i said it is not just for new muslims it is exactly what we need to hear especially as existing muslims mm -hmm. born into muslims unfortunately i have heard recently as well that a lot of new muslims come into the faith they have an expectation they've learned about islam and they walk away feeling quite disappointed because as you mentioned, mm. unfortunately, we are just performing the rituals in the mosques, in the house, during our salah. But in between our salah, we're not actually performing in the best akhlaq, in the best way, in the best behavior, in the treatment of others. And I've heard this constantly again and again and again, that unfortunately, unless you're strong in your faith, and especially as a new Muslim and you're coming in, people are very disappointed to see the actual community and how they treat each other, and also especially to the new Muslims. What would be any advice that you would give on this, Sheikh, before I move on to Catherine again? Yeah, Especially I think, I think the more, yeah, the, the, there is a responsibility there, and that responsibility is to all. Number one, to those who call themselves as uh, born Muslims, uh, they think that they have more right than others, which is something we, we don't have in Islam. Every Muslim is a Muslim whether a Muslim who was born as a Muslim or he accepted Islam as his new faith or the original faith. So the responsibilities for them, number one, are or towards them, that they should be, they should practice their Islam the way the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam wanted us to do. And the Holy Quran is very clear. Lima taquluna ma la tafal. Why, why do you say that which you don't practice? You have to act Islam and this say, you walk Islam, you talk Islam. This is exactly for each and every one of us. But for the new brothers and sisters who come back towards the religion of Islam, I can say also they need, as you said, you said very clear that some of them, unfortunately, when they come back to Islam, they reject it again. They go back to wherever they were because why they are not welcome. There is no room, enough room for them. And this is shame, truly speaking, to our brothers and sisters who misbehave in front of new Muslims. I know some cases where some, some brothers went and sisters, they were not even welcome. They were not even given salam. And there are many cases, as you say. So mm -hmm. for new Muslims, they need to be strong. Remember, when you come into Islam, you don't do anyone favor. You are doing your right action. I accept Islam. So do not make anyone to, to be there for you to say that I, I will become a better Muslim because of him. If we remember that and you become a strong Muslim, wherever you go, you can stand on your own. It's not easy for someone like Catherine to leave the community, to leave the family members, to leave the relatives to accept Islam. It's not easy to make this choice. I yeah. know because of that, they can go even a, many minds to stand in front of those who want to put them down as 
though you are second class Muslim. We don't have such a thing as a second class Muslim. So be strong. And another thing, make sure if you go to a, an environment where people do not welcome you, remember there are many places people are waiting to hug you, to accept you within the realm of Islam, to accept you within the big family of Islam. So always have an open mind and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will pave the way for you. Thank you. Absolutely. That was greatly said. What's your thoughts on that, Catherine? What's your experience and other sort of issues and challenges mm -hmm. that you face, especially when it comes to family uh, and also, um, you know, Muslims coming into the faith of Islam and looking at existing Muslims? Mm -hmm. What's your experience yeah. on that? Um, I, I'll talk briefly about it, but there's another subject I want to just touch on before we come to the end of the program if that's okay uh yeah it's uh well the thing is i i was quite alone as a christian because of my uh, beliefs or if you like lack of belief uh, regarding uh, who jesus was and the trinity um so and i had many times and it was very hurtful christians telling me you're you're not a christian you're not a christian you know until the point in my late 40s when i decided you're right <laughs> i'm not a christian <laughs> because i don't actually believe in the the main tenets of the religion but i love god and that actually is all that matters um so when i came to islam uh, you know uh, i i i i am very at home at the islamic uh, at the islamic center in maida vale this is my spiritual home. And uh, I also studied at the Islamic College. So I put myself, I consider, I put myself in the epicenter of Shia Islam. And, you know, I had the likes of Sheikh Hanif, who I still attend his classes, albeit remotely, and, uh, and, the, and the, the sheikhs and scholars at the Islamic College. I was completely, um, um, wrapped up, if you like, um, with very, very, very good Muslims. Um, you know, I thank God for that. Uh, but even so, if I go to a different mosque, I'm now living in Newcastle and I've lived in Sheffield, um, I, I shake. Uh, I, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm at home at this, uh, the uh, Islamic Centre. Uh, I, 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 f I can't speak the languages. I don't know the um, the the um, I was going to say customs. It's not the different. Um, you know, culture if you're Iranian, if culture mm. culture is the word. Yeah. So I'm I'm not part of any of this. Uh, I'm learning Arabic. Uh, I I now know the alphabet. It's just taken five years, but Alhamdulillah. Okay. <laughs> well, uh, day, yeah. So so yeah. It's very very difficult though. It's because, you know, I, I have no relationship with my brother anymore because uh, he is so against uh, Islam. Um, my parents have passed away, so uh, that's another issue. I've had problems with other relatives, cousins, because of Islam. Uh, although they're coming around now, I have to say, they're, they're, they're coming around. Um, but it's very, it is very hard for uh, new Muslims. Um, what I, one of the things about Islam, and it is true, Islam is a complete way of life. Um, and that's one thing that as at my age, definitely, I, I'm never going to have, I'm never going to have that total experience because I wasn't uh, immersed in it from a young age. It might be different for young women who marry a Muslim and they are um, surrounded by uh, the family and, and, and feel much more embraced into the day-to-day -day living of, of, mm -hmm. the, of, the, of the religion, of the culture, you know, even the languages. Um, and of course, their children will be born into, into Islam and, and they can learn a lot through, through their children as well. Um, my situation is very different, um, but I, I, you know, I'm used to being uh, alone with my faith. So for me, it, it's okay. 
I didn't go to the mosque to to shake people's hands or or say salam. I go to the mosque to to meet my God and to give thanks. And, and and it's the same as going to church. You know, I can't say I believe in Jesus. I can't say it because I do as a prophet, but I can't say that as that he's a God. I, I just cannot. Um, but I can go to church and give thanks to God for all the good things. I just want to very quickly, because I, you know, as you know, I'm a social worker and I work with children in um, in in care. And I'm very concerned. I I I I'm, I want to do a PhD in the subject. Um, um, I'm, it's just funding at the moment is an issue, but um, I'm very concerned about children that go into foster care. A lot of because we can't get enough Muslim foster carers coming forward for whatever reason, and there are lots of reasons for that. Um, and it's not just because they're Muslim; uh, it's 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 because the the the, the, the structure. You know the poverty, uh, not enough. They need a spare bedroom, uh, all sorts, and you know all sorts of reasons. Um, so a lot of Muslim children go into non-Muslim foster families or even adoptive families, and um, even if you know, I, I know that that a lot of uh, foster carers they know they should have a prayer mat, uh, they know uh, they should eat halal meat, they know. Um, that they fast in Ramadan, uh, but I don't know if they really know a great deal more than that. I mean, some, mm. in fairness, some foster carers go to huge lengths. Really, they go to the mosques, they go to the the the, the madrasas with the children. You know, they go to great lengths, but not everyone uh, feels uh, they wish to do that. Um, so they, a lot of them, know the basics, but they're not really able to support. Uh, Muslim children in this complete holistic um, wraparound way that a Muslim child is brought up in, you know, with a complete lifestyle and a way of thinking. And uh, it concerns me greatly. And I want to, um, I, you know, my I hope to research into what um, what the lived experiences of Muslims in care have been. For those that have been in Muslim families, because not always, you know, the cultures are so different, the sex are so different, uh, you know. So for for a social worker, you know, oh, it's a Muslim. Okay, put them with a Muslim, but they could be completely different. Some some Muslims practice very strictly, others less so, others not at all, you know. So um, I'm very interested to know what the real situation for our Muslim children when they go into care or are adopted. Um, and, um, you know, sometimes just being a brown person is enough. Oh, they're a brown person. Well, they're a brown person. Okay, we put them together. You know, I've had Afghan uh, Muslims being put with Sikhs, for example. Uh, okay. It's not wow. necessarily a good combination, you know, but they just say, oh, they're, you know, they're, they're brown. You know, so it must be I okay. It's so important that you're here today because you've highlighted something which I didn't even think about. And that's why I love these conversations and having your profession is so vital. And alhamdulillah, even having you on the show is an absolute pleasure and honor. And the fact that you raised this about foster care, which I know a lot of Muslim children, myself personally, that have gone into families that unfortunately are not Muslim. And we are lacking that in our Islamic sort of leadership where we're not taking that sort of stance to place ourselves in these positions to actually have the kind of say that if there is a Muslim child, you know, these are the requirements, these are the guidelines, and this is how we need to encourage even other families to, because there's a lot of families that can't have children, there's a lot of families that have these kinds of issues, and that is an option for them to continue to have, but we're not talking about this, we're not raising these issues. Sheikh, what is yeah. the... Um, of like ruling as well when Muslim children go into other families or can even a foster parent, a Muslim foster parent, take in a child that is not Muslim? What is the stance on that? It's a very, very important uh, sort of issue that Catherine has raised. Yes, indeed. I think uh, Catherine is thinking uh, in, in, in the way of Ummah, if we, if we can use the word Ummah, because she's thinking 
not only for herself, but she thinks about the wider community. And, and may Allah mm -hmm. bless you, make it easy, inshallah, for you to complete, inshallah, your PhD, inshallah. We'll keep you in your dua. And if uh, we can be of any help, please do not hesitate to be in touch, inshallah. Now, one thing which uh, we need to understand regarding the issue of foster, uh, fostering children, taking them into our, uh, if I can say, the, the Islamic way of upbringing, Islam encourages us to do so. It, Islam encourages us to take care of children, whether those children are Muslim or not Muslims. It doesn't matter. They are human beings. And in the Holy Quran, it's very clear. Uh, if you, you kill one person, it is as if you have killed the whole humanity. And if you raise one person, it is as if you have raised the whole humanity. And Imam Ali alayhi salam makes it very clear. A human being is either your brother in faith or you are equal in mm -hmm. humanity. So we need to think mm -hmm. about that. But I understand the issue of education is very important because some maybe some Muslims may think that uh, how can I take someone to take care of this young person until he becomes mature under my care. There is an issue of, of education which we need to uh, raise here. And thank you to Sister Catherine as well and this program, mashallah. Number two, there are jurisprudential issues regarding the issue of fostering. When this child becomes matured, then there is an issue of hijab between men and women. So it's just an education. It doesn't say when they become matured, but balir, then you take them out of your custody. It's not like that. But we need to continue to, to observe the laws which are there and to continue to take care of a human being who is in need. And the most important thing here, not to allow the faith of our young children who are taken into fostering, fostering and uh, 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 other cares by people who are not of the same faith. We need to think about that. If we don't take care of the young children now, eventually we will have adults with Muslim names, but they are not Muslims. And then we will be responsible for that. I believe all those who have come to live in the Western world, Muslims who have come to live in the Western world, in one way or the other, they have a responsibility to take care of the community which they live in and the wider community, which is for those who are not Muslims. No. Brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. That does really highlight a lot. What else would you sort of uh, suggest, Catherine, especially working on the ground with uh, the yeah. social care work that you do? What would you like to see amongst the Muslims that can assist well, well, in what you raised? Yeah. Well, part of the research I want to do uh, is in what we call kinship care. Now, kinship care is, for example, uh, Imam Ali is an example of kinship care. Uh, he was he was brought up by his um, cousin. Uh, I think the Holy Prophet himself is a result. You know, also was kinship care. He was he was brought up uh, by an uncle. If if I'm am I correct, Sheikh? Um, yes, you are. So yeah. So but the but the, but the 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 problem the problem with uh, with um, Muslim communities is uh, uh, I think a fear of the local authority. Um, uh, and there's reasons for that. We, I haven't, we haven't got time now to talk about that, but uh, there's a fear of the local authority. Um, there's a fear of the community and, and, and of uh, what the community will think. For example, if, if uh, one of the daughters uh, is involved in domestic violence or she has a partner with a drug addiction or something like that and she ends up losing her child or children, um, you know, uh, the, 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 if you take those children within the extended family or within the Muslim community, uh, that I think there's a fear of shame, uh, of honor to the family being damaged. So things are kept very quiet. Um, uh, the other thing I, I, and this needs to be 
this needs to be researched. Um, I'm not sure how much the local authorities and courts are looking to the Muslim side, because you get a lot of mixed race, uh, to the Muslim side of the family, which is quite often the father is Muslim and the mother is white. So when, when the, the family can no longer stay together, they look at the white family and, and may not look at the Muslim side of the family because there's a fear of, of not understanding Islam and uh, of not knowing what to do and not ha knowing how to, pre uh, pre uh, you know, how to, who, yeah, there's all these other is these issues. Um, so, uh, but I feel, uh, I certainly, I've done, uh, I've done, uh, I did my master's at the Islamic College and that looked at whether um, uh, British laws and policies were um, compatible with, with uh, Islamic uh, uh, thought and indeed uh, both uh, um, I, I was able to prove that both uh, fostering and adoption uh, adoption with 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 a little bit of changing uh, are both compatible to our Islamic principles however um, kinship care so care by uh, the the immediate or extended family uh, is I think the closest to Islam, um, yeah. but uh, well, I, I, I mean I I'd really like to hear. That. I'd like to hear from anyone who's 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 listening to this, who has been a child in care, um, mm. and has been either cared for by by family members, or uh, by Muslim foster carers, or by non-Muslim foster carers. I would really like to hear from from these people in, in strict confidence, of course. Um, the other thing I want to just very quickly, I'm sure you've gone over time, but it's very important. There's a lot of uh, Pakistani children who, uh, the girls in particular, they're put into care with uh, non-Muslims and immediately that makes them outside of that community. They can never return because they are uh, assumed, even if it's not true, uh, they, it's assumed that they will be having boyfriends, having sexual relationships, drinking, uh, you know, doing things that you would not be able to do if you were brought up within the community. And these girls in particular, when they leave care, they're put into flats on their own, which is something that never, ever, ever happens in the community uh, you know they should stay with the family until they marry and this is how this is the tradition of 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 not of the culture really as as you know more so i think than the religion but but the culture dictates that this should happen and these girls may be good girls they may be pure girls they may still be practicing muslims However, they're tarnished with the fact they've been in care in non-Muslim families. And in fact, there's so little understood about Islam and about, about the importance of the family and the culture, you know, the cultural meaning for, for, for Muslims to be together in the community. Um, that, you know, social workers can actually encourage children, you know, to have a boyfriend or a girlfriend because they think they're doing them a favor. They think they're giving them freedom. Uh, when actually they 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 they're destroying their 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 future chances as part of uh of their own community and they are then cast outs you know that they're, they're outside of the community and i remember one girl saying to me who is going to find me a husband you know who will marry me <laughs> you raised so uh, many important breaking. points, Catherine, and, and unfortunately, we do have only a couple of minutes left. But you know what? I am so, mm -hmm. so grateful for your thoughts and your insights today because you really, we need to do part two with you, literally. Um, we are not <laughs> even had a surface, really, of what you've just highlighted because you've literally taken my mind on a whirlwind. And I've got so many questions myself. But unfortunately, I'm going to have to leave it there with you, Catherine, to say thank you so much for your time. Please do stay online still. But the thing is, I just want to give uh, our Sheikh uh, a minute just to end the show to just give me your final thoughts before we end and uh, please take it away Sheikh. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, first of all I 
continue to pray to uh, for Catherine inshallah to be inshallah a better and better Muslim uh, who can uh, lead the way for others inshallah and uh, what I can say here is what we have seen from Catherine this is exactly what the Ummah of Islam wants this Ummah this Muslim bigger family will always continue to flourish because of the many ethnicities which are coming towards Islam. Islam is not the religion for one particular tribe or nation. Islam is for every human being. And when we come together, you can see the outcome will be the better outcome, inshallah ta'ala. So for that, I can say, uh, thank you to you, Sister Rashida, for inviting us. And uh, please have a program where you, where you can talk about fostering care and, and all those issues because they are very important. Absolutely. Thank you so much. And I'm so sorry that I've had to cut you both a little bit short because of time, but it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for watching as well. Inshallah, we will be back with another guest on another show and I will take your advice on board and hopefully we will discuss more on fostering. Thank you so much, Catherine, for sharing your insights. It's been so, so valuable. And um, Inshallah, thank you viewers for taking part and supporting and watching. That's why these shows are here to raise such important 